Good afternoon, everybody. I'm still Carlos Bustamante, uh, professor of genetics and uh, chair of biomedical data science. Um, our next session is really, really exciting. It's devoted to uh, the Chang Zuckerberg Initiative, and you'll be hearing from uh, two incredibly renowned and, and impressive speakers. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, CZI. Uh, this is an incredibly exciting organization uh, founded by uh, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, uh, Priscilla Chang. Uh, the goal is extraordinarily ambitious. It is to eradicate disease by the end of the century. Um, and while that seems audacious and perhaps a little bit crazy, um, it really has as its core driving uh, basic research as uh, a mission for understanding uh, the roots and causes of disease so that we can eventually uh, treat and, and prevent. Um, it is uh, funded through a $600 million uh, commitment. Um, in, in particular, the, the Biohub component of it is funded through a $600 million uh, commitment. And uh, as part of that, uh, they've initiated a first class of 47 investigators from UC uh, San Francisco, from uh, Berkeley, and from Stanford, and um, I happen to be lucky enough to be uh, one of that uh, one of the 47 in, in, in that inaugural class, and so that's why I got uh, chosen to, to to help uh, steer the discussion today. Um, the two people you'll be hearing from, though, are the real leadership. Uh, the the first is Corey Bargman, who is um, the uh, leading the science strategy for CZ. Uh, uh, Corey's uh, an investigator, a scientist, an educator that really needs no introduction uh, to this crowd. Let me just hit a, a couple of the highlights. She is the head of the Lulu and Anthony Wang Laboratory uh, for uh, Neural Circuits and Behavior and the Torsten N. Uh, Wiesel Professor at uh, Rockefeller. Uh, she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. She won the 2012 Kavli Prize in Neuroscience as well as the 2013 Breakthrough Prize in Life Science. Uh, pri uh, prior to uh, joining the Chang Zuckerberg Initiative, she was a Howard Hughes Medical uh, Institute investigator and she also co-chaired uh, the NIH's um, uh, committee uh, to spearhead uh, President Obama's uh, brain initiative. So we're extraordinarily lucky and pleased to have uh, Corey with us this afternoon. Uh, and, and she'll tell you a little bit about the leadership, uh, about the direction, and about the science uh, behind what we're trying to do. Uh, without further ado, Corey Bargman. Good afternoon. About a year and a half ago, on the birth of their first child, Max, Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan decided to give away the vast majority of their wealth to an initiative to advance human potential and promote equal opportunity. And the great generosity of this gift was inspired by Mark and Priscilla's own personal stories and interests. Priscilla is a pediatrician who cares deeply about children and is a physician and thinks of the problems that exist in medicine. Mark has seen how technology can change the way that people communicate and believes that technology has other untapped potential. So between the two of them, they are thinking about ways of using different mechanisms to these social goals for social good. And their first program was in education, which they've been in for about seven years. And the second program, which they announced in September of this past year, is a program in biomedical science following Priscilla's um, interest in medicine and Mark's interest in technology to move this field forward. So we have a goal in the Chan Zuckerberg Science Initiative. We also have principles. We have, um, we have the principle of investing for the long term. Our donors are still young and they want to think about what kinds of changes can happen in the long term. And that has led them to basic science as a means of advancing medicine. They believe in working with the leaders of the field and empowering them to do good work, in learning and listening, and in humility. And our first initiative, our goal for the science program, is to support basic science and technology that will make it possible to cure, prevent, or manage all diseases by the end of the century. Did I mention our humility? <laughs> but I want to say, I want to now unpack this statement and say that I think that this is a bold goal, but a bold that, goal that we should have. And the first and most important thing I want to say about this is that last phrase, the end of the century. So that's 83 years from now. So let's look back 83 years in time. It's 1934. And what is medicine like? 
we do not yet have modern antibiotics. And so four of the top 10 causes of death are bacterial infections, which we can now cure with antibiotics. We do not know that cigarette smoking predisposes to lung cancer, so we can now prevent cancers through changes that have occurred since that time. We do not know that high blood pressure and high cholesterol predispose to cardiovascular disease. We have no statins. We have no blood pressure drugs. We have no stents. We have no bypass surgery. And so the kinds of treatments for modern cardiovascular disease did not exist. Chemotherapy is a treatment for cancer. It did not exist. The understanding of the basic science of cancer had not yet happened. And so the increases that have happened in the past 20 years, where death rates from cancer have been falling 1% every year in the developed world, have not yet taken place. The overall mortality from these diseases has decreased by 50% in the time since that 83 years ago. And there's, no re there's been a lot of progress, people, and there's no reason that that should slow down with the kinds of advances we have now. I think almost anyone would think that we could cure all diseases in a thousand years. So many of the advances of the past few decades have come from the realization that what we thought would take 50 years could happen in 10, and perhaps what we thought would take a thousand years can happen in 100. So that's our mission at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. It's to think about what kinds of support for basic science and technology can provide an accelerating function, can accelerate all of research, and can cause these advances to take place. So here's how we're thinking about accelerating research. The first thing we think is that the problems that are out there right now in medicine are complex, and they are probably too complex for single individuals, no matter how brilliant, to address all of them. Instead, what we need are collaborations between people of different training. We need physician scientists, we need experimental scientists, we need the advances that come from engineering and computer science, and we need those people to collaborate to work together to make progress on the systems that we have. Now, I want to point out that we work in a system in science that tends to reward individual achievement and does not reward people for working together and for collaborating to make progress. So one thing we're doing is thinking about what those incentives are and how to create motivations and incentives for collaboration. The second thing we're thinking about is enabling tools and technologies for research. It's symbolized by the microscope. Before the invention of the microscope, no one knows that the human body is made of cells. After the invention of the microscope, everyone can see that the human body is made of cells. Advances in understanding very often come from advances in technology, not from advances, uh, conceptual advances. And so to the extent that we can support tools and technologies, whether those are physical tools like microscopes or computational tools like TensorFlow, we have the potential of raising all boats and making all of science advance more quickly. And then the third point, which is really important, is that this is a very generously supported initiative, but it's going to be about 1% of the size of the National Institutes of Health. And it cannot possibly do what it sets out to do as an individual group. The point is to support science and technology, and that means building support for science and technology at every level. The federal level, the international level, the grassroots level, everything that can be done to sort of create energy and excitement around this mission of using advances now to look in the long term to cure diseases. And I do want to say that it's important not to raise false hopes and make false promises. The end of the century is not going to help us. It's going to help our children and our children's children. And this is part of the investing for the long term that is so much at the heart of what Mark and Priscilla are thinking about. So in starting anything new, in an environment where there are a lot of smart people who've done a lot of great work, you have to think about what you can do to have a differentiated impact. And here's what we're thinking at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. We're a philanthropic organization. We have the ability to support other people to do work. We're not going to have our own internal research laboratories. We're going to look out to experimental scientists and position scientists and support their research. And that's one part of what we're doing. That's what we think of as the partnership funding part of our work. And that's what other lots of philanthropic organizations do. But we have two other pieces that we can add to meet our goals that have to do with our unique time, 
in and our unique place as being here in Silicon Valley and the connections that we have through Mark Zuckerberg. And so the first of those is that we have the capability of bringing world-class engineering and computer science to these problems in biomedicine. And this is really an issue in that basic science has not been able to be supported by the kinds of engineering that exist right now in the commercial sector. The computer science and machine learning and artificial intelligence that is used to sell you things you don't need is more sophisticated than that which is used in medicine and in education. And there's a real opportunity to bring those ideas back into the nonprofit social good sector. It involves being able to identify the people who can do this work, getting them to work together, and deploying them to these problems. And the lead on this is Brian Pinkerton, our chief technology officer who comes to us from Amazon where he sold us things we did not need, and is now um, really motivated to make progress in science and education and policy for um, this, this worthy goal. And then the other part that we see is something that we can do, again, um, that not everyone can do, that the National Institutes of Health can't do, for example, is take an active role in policy and advocacy. Um, perhaps a point that's particularly important today is to realize that we need to step up, we need to reach out to our elected officials, we need to speak out, we need to communicate through all of the different mechanisms we have and build support for science, build support for the kinds of biomedical research that will move this field forward. And that's being led at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative by David Pluff, who ran the 2008 Obama campaign and is really thinking in a serious way about what it takes to campaign for science and education. So the intersection between these represents where we think we could have an impact, and we try to choose projects and think about what will advance science, taking a couple of basic principles with that idea of, of putting different kinds of pieces together. So the first is, it's our goal to accelerate all of science. So that means that we have to ask ourselves when we do something, is this going to have an impact on the entire system, not just on one little piece in one location? Second thing is, can we do things at scale? Can we, by doing a particular kind of exercise or a particular kind of program, do something that will ultimately reach a large number of different scientists and a large number of different areas of science? The third is this concept of a differentiated impact. What can we do that others cannot? And the fourth is to use a principle of learning to try and, in each of our projects, try different things, see which ones succeed, and build on those to move forward, to be flexible and fast in our ability to identify and test new directions. So we've only started since September, and I've only been on board since October, and we're working out what we think we're going to be doing as an organization, and we have three ideas about what we can do to move biomedical science forward that I'll describe for you today. The first is the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, and I'm not going to talk about that in very much detail, except to say that it exemplifies the kinds of principles that we're trying to work on as we develop new ideas about how to support science. The second is a set of projects in transformative technologies for this tools and technology idea of moving science forward. And the third is a set of ideas about trying to create networks of collaborative science that will advance the field beyond what any single person can do. And each of these exemplifies our emphasis on trying to support collaborations, trying to bring engineering to science, and trying to bring different kinds of scientists together to make progress where individuals could not. So the first program I want to ask is, how can we try and support new kinds of collaborative institutions? How is it that we can get people to work together outside of their normal frameworks? And our first our first experiment in scientific organization is the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. Now, you're about to hear Steve Quake, the co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, talk about it more. I just want to make a couple of points about it here to highlight how it connects with our strategy for advancing science. So the first is that the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area where we are now, is home to three of the great research institutions of the world. The University of California, San Francisco, a great medical school, the University of California, Berkeley, 
a great undergraduate school with great um, quantitative and physical science, and Stanford University, where we are now, which has been a leader of computer science. Now, the potential and the brain power of these three institutions is tremendous, and, but they've never done a research program together, ever. And there's such an opportunity here to bring people together to try and solve problems. And that is what the Biohub is trying to do. To not completely start something from scratch, but rather to put people together in different combinations to make new discoveries. And in particular, to put scientists and engineers in the Bay Area together. Now, there are specific projects that they'll be doing in-house at the Biohub that Steve will tell you more about. And there are also projects that they're doing to reach out to their home institutions, to link together a broader set of scientists in the Bay Area to work on problems. And they perfectly exemplify this idea of new forms of collaboration. They perfectly exemplify the idea of bringing scientists and engineers together, because Steve Quake is in the Department of Bioengineering here at Stanford, and Joe Gerisi is a biochemist from UCSF. And they perfectly exemplify the focus on tools and technologies, which are a big part of what they are doing to develop there at the Biohub. So the second question we asked ourselves is, what kinds of tools can we help to support that would advance all of science? Because very much of the scientific enterprise is built around projects or around people, around specific research questions, and perhaps less attention is paid toward broadly enabling tools that by consistent support, by iteration, by dissemination and improvement, can really raise all scientific boats. And we're looking at different kinds of technologies that we think have that potential. So the questions that we're asking are what the best kinds of tools are, and what we would like are tools that are robust and reliable and scalable and shareable, that will make all of science more reliable and scalable and shareable. And there are two projects that we've gotten started on in those areas, in very different domains, that exemplify these notions. One of them is the Human Cell Atlas project, and one of them is a project in knowledge environments. So what's the Human Cell Atlas project? Oh, before I say that, when we support these technologies, we're taking an unusual model compared to most other philanthropic organizations or funding organizations. Most of these organizations provide support in the form of money to a research group and then look at their success. We're actually working side by side with the people that we fund so that we are both funding external partners through grants programs, but also using our highly skilled engineering and computer science and computational groups to help to build the tools alongside our, the investigators to create the greatest possible synergy between experimental biology and the skills we have in engineering. And this hybrid model is really well expressed in the first project that I'll tell you about, which is the Human Cell Atlas. So the project of the Human Cell Atlas is to try to identify and map all of the cells in the human body. You can think of it as like the Human Genome Project, but for cells. Now the human genome has 25,000 genes, it has, but the human body has 30 trillion cells. So this is a much more complicated problem, but it's 30 years later and we should be able to get at it. So what can we say about those 30 trillion cells? The first thing we can say is that we don't actually know how many different kinds of cells there are. We don't know if there are a thousand different kinds of cells or a million different kinds of cells that are unique in their function. And yet this is a critical function, this is a critical thing to know for understanding the human body and health and disease. And we keep discovering new cell types, like new kinds of cells in the immune system that are incredibly important for understanding autoimmunity or multiple sclerosis or developing new tools in immuno-oncology. All of those have been driven by advances in understanding different kinds of immune cells. So the potential of making advances from this is really considerable. Now, there have been advances in different kinds of experimental technologies and computer science that make it seem reasonable to understand what the cells are. How many different cell types are there? What is their molecular composition? What genes and proteins and small molecules are found in each of the different cell types? 
What is their location in the body? Who are their neighbors? How many of them are there? How do they change in aging? How do they differ in men or women or different healthy individuals? How are they affected by exercise and lifestyle? How do they change in disease? This just, I can't tell you how this particular project is going to point to one particular disease, but understanding this problem will provide a foundation that will allow all of medicine and biology to move forward. And the fun thing about this project is that it grew up from a grassroots level that a number of different scientists over the past five or so years have independently realized that this is something that we could do now. Um, one of them is Steve Quake, who will be speaking next. And these groups have started to come together to self-assemble into consortium meetings to talk about how to develop new methods to do this. And it's exciting for our organization, for the Chan Zuckerberg organization, to think about how we can support this grassroots scientific movement for this great problem and move it forward. So we're looking at this in two ways. Again, we're taking a hybrid model. The first is that we're funding people to do this research. We fund the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. It's a completely independent organization. So the Biohub exists as its own nonprofit medical research organization funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. But we are also, in particular, their technology includes development of tools toward a human cell atlas. So they are one of the recipients of our funding. The second is that we are funding scientists worldwide. We have requests for applications right now with applicants from six continents for pilot projects for the human cell atlas, for developing best practices, for um, figuring out what the best ways are creating to create the data and integrate them into a common open resource that can be used by all, just as the human genome is a common open resource that anyone can study. At the same time, we are helping to build what's required for the human cell atlas. This project is going to involve larger sets of data than any current genomic project by several orders of magnitude, and the existing systems that are not capable of handling the different kinds of data, whether it's sequence data or image data or other kinds of data that this will acquire. And so we're working now in partnership with multiple international groups with expertise in bioinformatics and data storage and genomics to build a data coordination platform that will serve as the common site at which these different kinds of information can be shared and built together. The second trans technology project we're working on has to do with scientific knowledge. So in the biomedical research literature, there are currently about 3,000 papers published every day. That's a million papers a year. I can't read all of them, and neither can anyone else. And so we have a real problem with communicating to each other what we know, making it possible for others to discover what we know, and to create the sort of maximum velocity of information transfer between scientists and physicians and engineers that will enable pro progress to be made in medicine. So we're thinking about ways of advancing those questions, and again, we're taking a hybrid approach in which to some extent we're building tools using engineering expertise, and to some extent we're funding others to support them in their roles of bringing knowledge awareness forward. So the tools we're building include um, a project called Chan Zuckerberg Meta. This was a small artificial intelligence company in Canada that was originally being developed for the publishing industry. It enables awareness of the literature in unexpected ways using modern artificial intelligence tools. It allows you to search the literature in a personalized way and in a predictive way that tells you not only what paper might have been cited a lot in the past, but what papers are predicted to be cited in the future and therefore should perhaps draw your attention now. So this is an example of using computational tools and modern artificial intelligence and machine learning to move searches for the literal literature forward. Another way that we're trying to accelerate science through knowledge environments is to accelerate the rate at which scientists share their knowledge with each other and the forms of sharing that they use to move forward. So right now, the main way that scientists share their knowledge with each other is through published papers. Published papers are a technology invented by Isaac Newton. And there are a lot of ways of sharing knowledge now that are more sophisticated, deeper, 
and potentially faster than those mechanisms for sharing information. We believe in the peer-reviewed literature. It's a fantastic way of sharing information, but it's not the only way. So for example, we think that um, one of the advances, exciting advances that's been happening now in science has been the development of preprints, ways of sharing information before it's been through rigorous peer review, but when you think you really have an understanding of a story with other people so they can start to build on it and think about it about a year earlier than they would do otherwise. And if you just keep following this logic, it makes it clear that it would be wonderful to be able to share other kinds of information as well earlier things, data sets, lab notes, protocols, and to create new ways of people sharing information, sharing their code, making things more interactive and discoverable so that all scientists could benefit from this acceleration of, of learning. So we're supporting the fat largest and fastest growing preprint server in biology, which is called BioArchive, through funding. And we're hoping to move that forward and think about new ways of sharing in this, in this, other, in this way of accelerating research. So finally, the last thing that we're thinking about are how we can enable collaboration across fields and locations to really celebrate the fact that science is not just something that happens in the Bay Area and in Boston, but science is something that happens across the United States, across the world, in developing countries, in developed countries, to try to create networks of scientists. Now, again, science is largely conducted in, in great institutions, institutions like Stanford, which have a lot to say for themselves. But there are other ways of putting people together. The Biohub is not replacing Stanford, it is supplementing Stanford. And we would like to think of other ways of supplementing the way that people work together. And it seems to me that the people who brought you Facebook can think about new ways of getting scientists to work together in broader ways. We're thinking about this in a variety of different ways, but what we're thinking about now is how we can go about building and supporting new kinds of interdisciplinary teams that would include scientists from around the country and around the world. We're, we're, we're passionate about bringing new people into fields of science, of bringing, for example, people who are really rigorously trained in cell biology and biochemistry into medical fields where perhaps they haven't had access to those kinds of information before, of bringing computational scientists to the large data sets that emerge from biological imaging and start to um, untangle the information that is hidden in these complex images. And so by moving across different kinds of scientists and across different kinds of science, and by bringing new people together, we have hope that, that we will create the kinds of new knowledge superimposed on our specialized knowledge that will advance science. Thank you. <laughs>